Hi, this is Jean Shanley Thomas, and welcome to Passing the Torch. I am so glad that you're here today. I'm so glad to be with you. I knew that the Lord was giving me a little break, but boy, we've got a good topic today. Uh, the topic is, God is not our enemy. Doesn't that sound good? Well, we're going to get into some scripture. We're going to really look at some stuff. So I hope that you'll get your Bible and follow along with me. But right now, let's uh, pray first, and then we're just going to jump in. Father, I thank you for your word. It's alive and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it quickens us. Lord, we thank you. It's a living word. And Lord, I pray that you open the eyes of our understanding today as we read through your, your words and your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, I love God's word is so alive. <laughs> you guys, I've been doing this 43 years, and I'm just as fired up if not more in love with Jesus than I ever, ever have been. It just gets richer and deeper, so don't quit, all right? All right? Amen. So let's go to Matthew chapter 16. What I want to talk about is God is not our enemy. You know, it is such a, a, a slick thing that the enemy slips in that'll just get you off a little bit. You know, if you're on a straight line and you just get a little bit off, you know, just a little bit off. Well, the further you go, the more off just that little. At the beginning, it seems small, but you know, there's so much of that going on. I tell you what, and this is one that Jesus, this is one really huge point I want to bring up that uh, Jesus warned his disciples about. That warning goes to us. You know, the Bible says that Jesus, you know, warns. How could we think God is our enemy? When he's the one that warns us to look out for this and that and the other thing, you know what I'm saying? It's like, wow, uh, God is not our enemy. And stick with me for this lesson, and by the end of it, your, your faith will be strengthened, and any doubts that you had, or maybe you're going to actually see you had a little bit. Because I tell you what, guys, like I said, I'm 43 years into this, and I was listening to a particular uh, minister for, for years, okay, and this began to slide into their life, and had I not have caught it, you know, but the Holy Spirit helps us, but let's look at what he did with the, the apostles, Matthew 16, chapter 6, it says, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, so what is the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, okay? This was back in the days when Jesus walked the earth. There was Pharisees, this took place in Israel, um, and, and there were certain doctrines that they held on to. But basically, in short, the leaven of the Pharisees is to go back to salvation by works, okay? So you and I know that we are saved through grace, by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? Okay, our salvation, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Our salvation is through faith, okay? Now, in the Old Testament, their salvation was through works and obeying the Mosaic law, okay? And they were right to do that up until the point. Now, let me read you something. It's crazy. If you're of Jewish descent, listen up carefully, and I really encourage you to go find yourself the prophet uh, Jeremiah, okay? Actually, man, this is so awesome. It's so cool. So this is written 626 years before Jesus Christ came on the scene, all right, before Jesus Christ was born. Uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 31. It says, behold, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit because it's long and for our time's sake here, but you can look up the whole thing. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. See, 626 years before Jesus was ever born, God began to prophesy through his prophets all along, the Israel, Israel's prophets. It was hidden there. All right, listen, I will put my law 
in their minds and write it on their hearts. How is this different from the Old Covenant? The Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, was written on in stone, all right, and enforced by, um, you know, their judges and their prophets and everything. All right, I will put my law, this is the new one, in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall know me. They shall all know me. Ah, this new covenant is awesome. They shall all know me, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. So 626 years, give or take, before Jesus ever came on the scene to fulfill this and bring in the new covenant, it was prophesied by Jeremiah so clearly, okay? I will forgive their iniquity and their sins I will remember no more. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Is this not the beauty of the new covenant that we can all have Jesus in our hearts and the Holy Spirit indwelling us? The covenant is awesome. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. This is such a different new covenant. But it was prophesied to the Jews. See, everything that God did throughout the Old Testament was building up to the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But what they didn't understand is that first he had to be the sacrificial lamb before he could come back the second time and be king, which he is, is coming, y'all. <laughs> so when we look back at the Old Testament, God just interwove so many things about the coming Messiah so that they would recognize Jesus, okay? Even though, and many did, all right? All of the apostles did. There were many followers. All the, most of the apostles were Jews, okay? And, and they got it. They God opened their eyes. But if you go back and you look at Psalm 22, this is way back to David prophesying this about they'll pierce my hands and my feet. And then you go back to Isaiah chapter 53. It describes Jesus' suffering on, uh, on the cross, his suffering and his life, what it looked like to the T. Okay? Isaiah 53 Psalm 22, and here I just read you Jeremiah 31, 31. So why is this important that I'm talking about this? Because I'm talking about we are now in a new covenant, all right? We don't follow the Mosaic law. And I tell you, I see it because I see there is a movement of this Pharisee spirit. Now, the spirits that motivated these Pharisees back then are the exact same one. All right, you guys understand that fallen angels and demonic spirits are eternal. They're not, you know, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. Hallelujah. But they're, they don't have bodies. They're not living like you and I are in human flesh. And they are influencing people. This is why this is just as important for us today as it was back then for them. Because the exact same spirits motivating this lie is pushing it now. It's coming in different places, and we have to be leery of it. What did Jesus say? Take heed and beware. He says that as much to us as anybody. So the leaven of the Pharisees is trying to get people to go back to salvation by works. Okay, we are saved through faith. That not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Okay, that's what you and I believe as Christians, all right? And we have to understand why it's such a different covenant, all right? Because Jesus paid the price. He was the sacrificial lamb, okay? Why, all of these metaphors of him, like in the Old Testament, the sacrifice, even Bethlehem, where Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there was a place called Bethlehem Ephratah, if I'm saying it right, or I don't do, do Hebrew too good, but... Even a certain place in Bethlehem, Jesus was born. Why? This was the place where the sacrificial lambs were kept and cared for because they had to be perfect.
to be taken to the temple and sacrificed. They had to be kept. Jesus was even born in a specific place in Bethlehem. How awesome is that? You guys, God just, he doesn't miss anything. There's so much to be uncovered, you know, and and only he can. He reveals things like that. But there's so much in the scriptures that we miss, and it just takes time, you know, as we go. But scripture is fantastic. It's awesome, and it's living and alive. You know, when, when God opens your eyes to these things, it just fires you up, right? It's awesome. So we have to be careful of the levit of the Pharisees. Like I said, there was some there was some particular I was listening to, and they were kind of slipping it back into you know. Uh, I think one of the things they said that finally I went, oh gosh, I caught that. They said if you have a certain amount of darkness still in your heart that you haven't purged, um, that darkness will take you to hell. You know when you die, if it's there when you die. That is the opposite of scripture. And it's just an odd thing to me that that this man could say that because he has so much revelation on other stuff, you know, and he has dreams and visions that are accurate. They come to pass. And I'm like, man, how could he be missing it on that little part? But it said this, this particular leaven comes to, it starts out small. How does leaven work? You put yeast in bread, in flour, okay? And over time, over time, the yeast makes the dough begin to rise, okay? That's what he's talking about. You just put a little piece of yeast in the dough and it begins to rise, okay? And it's the same in us. When we get a little bit of that legalistic Old Testament law kind of thing, it can grow into something ugly that will choke the very life out of your salvation and your understanding of your salvation and the joy of your salvation, okay? The more I was listening to this person, the joy of my salvation was just like, ah, it took me, I'm like, oh, Lord, how can this be? But it is. And you and I, what did he say? Take heed and behold, Jesus said, of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's a spirit and it can creep in. Now, I had another person, I knew that they uh, they actually went to the same school that I went to, the Bible school, and uh, they have gone back to the Mosaic Law, practicing 613 commandments of God. Uh, they now discount everything that the Apostle Paul said. They are against Christians. They don't even speak of themselves as believers anymore. And you guys, I graduated Bible school with them. I love them. I pray God opens the eyes of their understanding and I understand they get frustrated because Christians weren't walking um, like Christians. They were uh, abusing the grace of God. But you guys, just because people abuse the grace of God and trample on it, we can't throw away grace. We can't throw away the, the fact that our salvation is by grace. We are saved through grace It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Okay? We got to cling to that. And and you take that sword. Bible says the word of God is a sword. And you bat the truth away when when it comes against you. When it's not, I mean, the truth, the untruth away. When it comes and it's against the truth of God, you take the sword of the spirit, which is the truth. All right? So I understand how he got where he did. Okay, and you know, I was around, uh, God took me for a, a six, eight, 12 month season around, you know, Messianic and I, Jews, and I got very enriched, you know, very enriched by it. You guys, I mean, it's great. I, I recommend uh, one for Israel ministry that you look them up on Facebook. They're doing an awesome work for Jesus Christ in the land. Um, So I just wanted to throw that out there. But God is doing a work. But we have to understand the time that we live in, the day that we live in, and the things that are out there. And we need to hear, beware, and take heed, okay, when God says to. All right, enough of that. Let's move on to the next point. So, but my point of this whole lesson is God is not our enemy. God has very carefully spelled out in his word, and says things like this, beware, why do you, why do you tell your children not to run in the street? Why do you tell your children not to run around with knives? 
why do you tell your children, you know, don't eat dirt, you know, <laughs> there might be dog stuff in it. Why? Because we are protective of our children. Why would we think our creator, our heavenly father that calls us, calls us his sons and daughters, why would we ever think he's not trying to protect us? Okay. You should never read scripture and feel bondage. Okay. It's not bondage. It's protection. And if there's something in you that makes you feel bondage, maybe it's because you've never known protection. And Lord, I just pray God will heal anyone that I understand that. You guys, I did not have a protective father. I did not have protective men in my life. Uh, even the men of God, there was very few. There was a few that were protective. But they didn't have that protective spirit in them. So I didn't know how to receive it from God. And I wasn't didn't have an emotional relationship with my, my natural dad. He was very sweet and kind. But I didn't know him. We didn't talk. We didn't have conversations. He was silent at the dinner table, you know. I didn't know him, so I didn't know, and he was very distant, um, so I didn't know a protective father. Um, he wasn't protecting us because he really didn't know what was going on in our lives. You know, parents, I really encourage you. You need to know what's going on in your kids' lives. You need to make time to talk with them. You need to make time to have enough of a relationship with them that they can pour out their heart to you and let you know what's going on in their little lives or in their teenage lives. You know, it's it's not about you just enforcing rules, 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 rules. Okay, that's where I think we miss it, uh, is we think God's like that. God's not about enforcing rules, 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 rules. That's not who God is, all right? When God gives rules and guidelines and says, beware of this, it's for protection because of his outrageously intense love for us. He doesn't want you hurt. He doesn't want you wounded. He doesn't want you walking off into a sin that he knows is going to destroy you and bring hurt and destruction to your soul. See, God knows the end from the beginning. If God's warning you about something or giving you checks about a person in your life or relationships here or there, it's because he sees the future, you guys. He's not limited to time. He can see the future and warn you right here and now. That's why we have to learn to trust that. All right, let me move on. God is not our enemy. Let's go to James 1, 12. And let's read here. You guys can join me if you like. So it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Okay? Did you hear that? That's so important to know. Because sometimes, and I've, I've done this too, where I've gotten into the thing where I'm thinking, okay, well, this trial is here to just grow me, and I'm being crushed. And it's like, <laughs> you know, and... and in, in, in a minor bit, you know, God uses that. Now, I want to get in and really define this because if you look at it that way um, and you don't see what he is saying here to us, uh, you can just start feeling like God hates you. Why is all of this happening to me? God hates me. No, you want me to tell you who hates you? Satan hates you. Yes, he does. <laughs> okay, so look. But each, okay, I am tempted, let no man say I am tempted by God, for he cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So God never brings temptation to you. Does God sometimes test you? Yes, that's a whole different thing. Please hear me, okay? We're going to talk about it today. It's a whole different thing to be tested by God than it is to be tempted. Temptation comes from Satan. Let's read on. All right. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Enticed by who? He just said it wasn't him. Who entices? Who seduces? Who steals, kills, and destroys? John 10.10, 10, Satan comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The one who seduces and entices us to do things is Satan. He entices us in areas of our flesh that we have weaknesses, 
Okay? So, okay. Then the desire, when the desire is, so we're tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, our own desires get, that's where Satan entices us, okay? Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Brings forth death. So why do we not think that God's going to teach us all about how to get those things, strengthen our soul in truth so that Satan doesn't have those things to entice us with. You know, the word of God strengthens us. Okay. Why? Because the father doesn't want us to be at the mercy of this ruthless tormentor. Yeah. Okay. Let's read on. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. All right, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of God, which is able to save your souls. Okay, so this is not talking about salvation. We're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, this is talking about our, our mind, will, and emotions, our soulish part of us. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does. So God is trying to lead us into the place of being blessed, okay? So we need to not be deceived. Every good gift, if something is not a good gift, okay, you it says every good gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, okay? Now, this is where people make mistakes. I've done it myself, okay? Romans 8, 28 says, All things work that God can cause. Okay, so let's go back to the Garden of Eden, all right? Let me go back to that. Back in the Garden of Eden, Eden did God want Adam and Eve to sin? Did, did he want that? I mean, it would have been better if they hadn't have done that, okay? I mean, it was just one tree, one request, and it brought death to them. My goodness, that hurt God and the king, hurt everything so much. It cost God his son. It cost him so much suffering. Did God want Adam and Eve to sin? I don't think so. But because God foreknows everything. He dwells outside of time. He can look into any point of time he wants. He can see it all at once. All right. Don't ask me to explain that. I'm not omnipotent, omniscient, omniscient, right? Okay. I'm not omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent. Okay. Whatever. I'm not everywhere like God is. Okay. Neither are you, but God is. Okay. He knows the end from the beginning. So right there when, before they did it, God, the second it was done, he already had a plan to get them out of this mess, to get humanity out of this mess, mess, right? He had the plan already. But did he want that? No. I don't believe that he did. You may disagree with me. That's fine. I don't believe that he did. But because God comes in on the scene so quickly, you might think that he planned it. Did he plan for this bad thing to happen? Now, let me give you a great uh, illustration from, uh, from my life. My sister was living in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, right? And she was in an apartment. And one night, some man came up and 
tried to break in her apartment. Okay, she had a little boy and he tried to break in her apartment and it freaked her out so bad. And something scared the guy away. Now, she found out the next day, of course she called the police, and she found out the next day that most likely this man went down a few apartments down the street and murdered somebody. That messed with her head. She freaked out and she's like, why did God do this? Why did God allow this? Why did God this and that? And I told her, I said, you know, my sister, look, you know, and this is the crazy thing. She did not catch this. So like a week or two before that, so for some reason, she went out and she had nailed the screen. I think because she had a little boy. She didn't want him pushing the screen out. She had nailed the screen on so it couldn't be pulled off or pushed out from the inside or pulled from the other. And I don't think she realized who, who inspired her to do that. The Holy Spirit, right? God was looking out for her. And the guy didn't get her. And so the Lord told me to send her this letter. And this story was told to me. So there was a little boy and a dad that lived in a little town. I'm getting somewhere with this. It's got a point to it. So they lived in the town. And uh, was, there were not a lot going on in the town. So every time, this is kind of like my mother and her dad. Every time the fire alarm would go off, they would run upstairs, look out over the town and see where the smoke was. And then get in the car and go over there. And so the little boy with this dad, every time they would see the smoke, they would go over there, there'd be firemen there. And so this little boy came to the conclusion. He said, Daddy, why are these firemen so bad? And the dad said, what? Why do you think firemen are bad? And he said, every time we go there, they've started a fire. <laughs> and don't we do that sometimes? When God shows up on the scene to rescue us, we sometimes assume that maybe he started the problem to begin with. We make that same silly assumption. You know, just like my sister was freaked out. Why did God allow this? Why did this happen to me? You know, but he, she didn't see the rescue in it. She didn't see the protection there. She didn't see, you know, that God uh, is a redeemer of things. Now, when the enemy does get away with things, and sometimes he does, you know, why? I don't know. Some, there's not enough prayer over people. There's not prayer over areas. It could be just prayerlessness where things happen. but and, and it's heartbreaking. But God is the rescuer, not the cause. All right? Did God want somebody to rape you? Did he want that man to rape me? No, I was raped. Did he want that? Did God set that up? No. That was meant to take me down and take me out and stop me from going forward in the ministry and in life altogether. That was from Satan, from the pit of hell. God did not want that. All right. God dealt with it and healed me. He redeemed me from that. All right. And yes, I was made stronger. And yes, I have more of a testimony. But did God put it on that man to do that? No, no, Satan did. But God knows all of his plans. God knows all of his plans and God showed up. All right. Showed up and healed me as I cried out to him. All right. But this is how we need to understand when we get into things that we cry out to God because now Romans 8, 28, God causes all things he can when we go to him all things to work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So whatever demonic thing touches your life, there is God can, when you give it to him, he can take that thing and turn it into gold. You then, when it's in God's hands, can have a powerful gift to give to someone else, to comfort someone else, okay? You know, I look back and there's a part of me that's glad that happened because I can look people in the eye and say, hey, it happened to me too. You know, it's this is the human experience. We are here. Satan's real. He's evil. He's wicked. He wants to destroy us. He wants to stop us. But guess what? 
We can be overcomers through Jesus Christ. We can let him heal our souls. We can give him our wounds and our hurts and let him heal us from all of these things. Okay? But God is not the one doing the wickedness. Satan, John 10.10, 10, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it's real easy to get that just a little bit off on that, you know, because um, you don't understand. You don't understand what's happening or, or why, you know, God allowed it. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> why God allowed it, you know. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, did God want Adam and Eve to do that in the garden? No, but he had a plan. And whatever happens in your life, you go to him and he has a plan for, for redemption. And whatever the enemy tries, he can make it turn into gold for you. It can be so rich for you in the days to come. As you allow God to heal you of whatever happened in your life, whatever tragedy you've been through, when you can turn around and give that to somebody else and lift them out of their dark place, the reward and the joy that you get in your spirit is worth anything materialistic. <laughs> there is nothing like peace. There is nothing like the Prince of Peace. Amen. You know, p peace and joy and love have such a greater value than money and gold and silver, a house, clothes. What, you know, peace and joy. When you can lay down in peace and you have peace inside of you. Some of you need to seek God for that. Okay? Some of you need to seek God to be healed from anxiety and uh, some of you need to seek God to be healed from different things uh, and to let God work in you and on you. And that's another area we can get a little mixed up in. And, and I really want to bring clarity to that. I am not going to do that today. Um, I, I think I'm going to do another one. I may just call it story time. I don't know. I, we're going to do some more. But I really wanted you to understand that just because God had foreknowledge like of Adam and Eve, what they were going to do. He knew what their choices were. He, They have free will, so he didn't interfere with their choice. But once they made their choice and the enemy got involved and started tearing them up, okay, he had a rescue plan. And he always does for us, okay? God gets misrepresented. He's not wicked. He's not evil. He's not boom, boom. You know, Jesus said, I didn't come to earth to judge the earth the first time, all right? When Jesus came in all this 2,000 years, you know what I'm saying? He, this happens after, you know, the second coming. The first coming, he was the sacrificial lamb, comes as the Messiah. And that's how the Jews missed it. All right. Um, oh, there's so much. Okay. That's why we can trust God when we make mistakes. Let me make sure I've gotten over all the notes I wanted to. So whatever... You know, you may have made decisions and stepped out of it. The will of God, you know, God is just right there to restore you. He wants to restore you. Who talked you into making the mistake? Who talked you and enticed you into going off in the wrong direction? Satan did. Your own desires, your own lust were enticed. Satan knew your weakness and enticed you. Okay? As we learn these things and learn that God is not our enemy... He's our rescuer. He's our healer. He's our savior. When we get these things right, the enemy has less power over us. And we can begin to go to God. And, you know, if you see patterns in your life where you're making the same mistakes over and over again, getting hurt by it, choosing the wrong relationships, the wrong decisions, go to the Father and say, Lord, look at this. Why do I keep doing that? Why, what is broken in me that makes me choose that? What is broken in me that makes me choose that? God wants you to ask that question because he wants to heal it. He wants to heal it and seal it so that Satan no longer has a place in you to entice you. Okay? Let me read that scripture because it is really good. It's interesting because... Um, John 14, 30, it says, I will no longer talk much with you, Jesus speaking to his disciples, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. 
That's why Satan couldn't stop Jesus. There was nothing in him that the enemy could pull on, you know, entice. All right. Jesus overcame everything. You know, he pulled on his flesh, but Jesus didn't give in because there wasn't, when there's wounds in us, those are weaknesses that the enemy can entice and pull us. Uh, if there's, you know, a lack of a father's love, you know, those are places the enemy can access. If there's wounds from uh, being molested as a child, those are areas that are not, if they're not healed, the enemy can access. If there's wounds from this or that, or maybe you were hurt by a church or a pastor or whatever, and that's not healed, the enemy can access you in that area and keep you from the path God wants for you. Okay? That makes sense? So let's pray. Father, I just pray that your people, that all of us today will understand with great clarity that God is not our enemy. You are not our enemy. You are our rescuer. You're our savior. Savior. Let that word become deeper in their understanding that you're our savior, our rescuer, our healer, the lover of our souls, Lord. You're our parent. You're the father of us. We are your creation and your children, Lord. Let these truths dwell richly in us, Lord, that we be not deceived and that we not go along with the crowd that is soon going to turn against God and, and blatantly attack him in so many ways. Let this truth be established in us from now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So God already knows what the enemy's coming up. Uh, I tell you what, blasphemy, you never heard what's going to come up later. They're going to just attack the character of God and blaspheme God like nobody's tomorrow. This is why God wants us strong in scripture, strong in the truth. So I encourage you to listen to this again. All right, and go back and jot down the scriptures that I was talking about. Look them up for yourselves. Make this concrete within you. And do business with God. Your Father loves you. He doesn't want you with woundedness in your soul, with weaknesses in your soul that the enemy can hook and entice and pull you off the path he has for you. Okay, he loves you. He loves you. Well, God bless you guys. We will see you next time, and I look forward to it. Y'all have a great uh, few weeks, and I'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.